Great. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Agri-Food Conversations brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. My name is David Yoakum. I'm, I'm an associate on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to welcome you to our discussion today. Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in agriculture. Each month, we highlight a specific theme, uh, including emerging uh, topics such as soil health, um, plant genetics, vertical farming, aquaculture, to name a few. This month's theme is seed genetics and crop diversity. And on today's call, we're joined by Martha Schlicker, CEO of Plastomics. Plastomics trade delivery platform provides solutions for uh, many current biotech seed industry challenges. Multi-trade products with complex trait integration and breeding programs, increasing pest resistance development, requiring higher trait dose and new modes of action, and the inability to expand the reach of biotech traits to crops uh, without crossing concerns. Providing solutions to these challenges will give seed companies a valuable tool to help growers meet the nutritional needs of a growing population. Now, each of you knows that companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We've invited you to this call because you are some of the smartest, most talented people in Plastomics market. You're potential customers of Plastomics products and services. You have built a company similar to Plastomics, or you are a sophisticated business person or ag agricultural professional who understands the market and the challenges and opportunities Plastomics may face. Before we get started, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Please take a few seconds to answer. And while we're doing that, a few process comments. Uh, we are not soliciting investment. This presentation is to provide information to help Plastomics find customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships that can help them grow their business. You are all on mute. You can use the chat window to ask a question at any time, and typically we answer all questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, and finally, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further delay, I'm pleased to introduce Martha Schlicker, CEO of Plastomics. Martha, please feel free to take it away. Thank you, David. Let me see, it's, there we go. So really appreciate the opportunity, David, and I select this forum. I know I have learned a lot from, so appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about the Plastomics story and we, we benefit from the network you uh, connect us with on a regular basis. So great to have this broader exposure and opportunity. So let me, let me kind of take a step back to help you understand uh, the importance and the, and the value of the plastid, plastics transformation uh, delivery platform. So we're all largely familiar in this audience with the huge transformation that biotech crops have provided. Right now, since the early 90s, our ability to insert a trait into an actual seed to provide season long control against insects or disease, or to make those plants resistant to really environmentally friendly broad spectrum herbicides, just transformed the industry allowed for the, the broad adoption of, of these traits globally, uh, over 200 million hectares, because of that ease of use, that season long control, the ability to reduce the environmental footprint of agriculture with reduced insecticides, and to give growers peace of mind, leading to an $18 billion annual market. Many in, in this audience probably are familiar with the term, you know, the Roundup Ready generation, from growers that grew up being able to use Roundup Ready technology in their crops that dramatically eased um, agricultural production. Unfortunately, with all that success, we now also have some challenges. And that's because of that success. So that broad spread adoption on many acres has led to resistance developing by both insects and weeds that now um, can, can tolerate these traits and are no longer um, killed by it. So this has, has continued to multiply kind of year after year after year, which is acquire, requiring now the introduction of chemistries that, that sometimes hadn't been used for decades or requiring us to stack trait upon trait upon trait to have multiple modes of overcoming that resistance in the crop. In the case of a crop like, like corn, the trait also ends up in that corn pollen. And that pollen, you know, with wind can flow. So that can result in the contamination of a, of a crop next door. It certainly results in increased development costs because you can't put a trait in a field under development close to another trait under development in another field. 
and it limits also the number of crops that are viable for chloroplast for uh, nuclear transformation because um, so in some cases that pollen can outcross to other species that then would become um, you know horrific horrific weeds with that uh, resistance tolerance. The last thing is um, there was a promise early on with traits that they would deliver increased yield, that we would be able to find elusive stress or yield genes. And that really hasn't panned out. And in fact, the reverse has happened as we've had a stack multiple traits, they actually have in some cases negatively impacted the yields of the crops they're looking to help improve. A good summary of it is here in this slide where if you look on the left, uh, that is the introduction of uh, Bt, which is a, a protein found in soil that's toxic to insects that damage crops, but not to other things like bees and butterflies. Broadly adopted here, you can see millions of acres, over 200 million acres of these Bt crops because of their ability to control those worms. But now, unfortunately, see on the right, we have insect upon insect that has developed resistance to these Bt proteins present in those biotech crops. In the case of herbicides, the first generations were really great in that they allowed us to use broad spectrum, really environmentally safe herbicides across corn and, and soybean crops to get weed control. As resistance has developed to those herbicides, it has forced the large agricultural companies and growers to have to go back to chemistries that were first launched, right? To, to help with um, what we were up against in the world wars, not exactly new technology. So this is why plastomics becomes so important. Knowing what we know now, we want to find ways to have overcome that resistance. We find, want to find ways to not have that pollen flow. We want to find ways to be able to really control and regulate where we put those traits into the germplasm. Plastomics does that by introducing the traits via a new delivery platform, and that's in the chloroplast instead of via nuclear transformation. The chloroplast is unique in that you can really precisely target where you want that trait to go. It can be done in a manner that's going to be really abundant. So if you see in this little picture to the left, those are all chloroplasts in a cell. Any trait that we put in for say insect control is gonna end up in every single one of those chloroplasts. So you can see how those expression levels are gonna be high. It, because of that, abundance because of the preciseness, we're able to do it really efficiently and really cost effectively. And because it only passes on through the mother, you don't end up with any of that trait in the pollen. And it also means that every kid is going to be the same, which really simplifies the downstream processes. So think of it like a mom and a dad where the mom has blue eyes and the dad has brown eyes and the kids are going to be a mix. In this case, all of the kids are gonna have blue eyes. So all of those kids are gonna be the same, all of the thing that you are, are wanting in the next generation. So we're eliminating that yield drag problem. We're eliminating that pollen contamination problem. We're addressing the fact that we can get much higher expression levels. And so the need for, for pesticides goes down and it simplifies the process again, where all kids have, have blue eyes that it can reduce the amount of development time to bring new traits and, and germplasm to market. So the grower benefits return, right? We've, we've reversed this resistance in the case of insects, increased the expression levels in, in both that also allows herbicides that have been left on the side to potentially be valuable again. Uh, eliminating that pollen flow, uh, eliminates a lot of the, the cost concerns, the liability concerns that come along with that, the buffer and other containment that needs to put in place and opens up new markets like sorghum or the potential expansion into other uh, areas. Canola is a biotech crop to date, but it's limited because of those concerns about outcrossing. And I've already referred to the fact that, that current traits are, are faced sometimes with yield limits or yield reduction 
if you can put a trait in the chloroplast, which really is the photosynthetic engine of the plant, the possibility now really exists that you could really enhance yield. And this could, of course, then reduce the amount of acreage that's required for agriculture, reducing the environmental footprint of agriculture that opens up expansion of new markets like broader expansion of the use of biofuels, bioplastics, biomaterials. So that allows for new solutions for the existing markets that again, total about $18 billion today across disease, insect and weed control. Opens up the new possibilities for yield traits and also the possibility for some nutrients. So creating um, value adding traits that are more attractive to potentially some downstream and consumer markets. So where is the company at today? Well, we have the system up and working in soybeans. We're able to show that we can introduce the traits that we want, regenerate those plants. And you can see here, uh, we've introduced a, a fluorescent protein. And it's just amazing to me, look at, look at the abundance of that trait in, in the leaf cells that are fluorescing there. You can see how you're gonna have such high levels of expression and control. And clearly we've got to make sure that those plants are viable. Here's the soybean plant in the greenhouse. You can see that it's fertile producing soybean seeds. We have a, a pipeline then of traits in soybean that have multiple purposes. The first are traits to show that we can do it and we can do it as well as we can do it in the nucleus. The second uh, kind of generation of traits are traits that we are gonna believe are gonna uniquely be better in the chloroplast or potentially can't be done in the nucleus at all. You can see we're at various stage of development across disease, weed, insect, and ultimately the quality traits I was mentioning earlier. In the case of corn, we're a little further back, but we expect to have that system up and running this year. We're actually approaching it in two different ways. It's a little more difficult in corn because the standard transformation process for corn uses non-green tissues. And clearly for us to work with the chloroplast, we need those green tissues. So we have two new approaches in order to be able to do that. Two way, new ways of being able to select um, what ends up being viable. Uh, provisional patent actually you know, filed and in the works and a legal opinion that support that we will have freedom to operate in this space. So exciting work uh, again in, in this space uh, because of, of the status of our patent applications, I'm being a little more guarded in what I can talk about here. I also mentioned that we're trying to show that we can do things that haven't proved to be very viable with a nuclear approach. We all know that RNAi is a promising technology, certainly for spraying onto crops for control, but we all know the rigor of having to go in repeatedly to spray on a crop and the benefit of getting that in via trait for season long control. So we've been able to show in a model system that we can introduce RNAi in uh, uh, tobacco to be able to control this tobacco hornworm very effectively. So we're optimistic that we'll be able to show these same kind of results with RNA in both corn and soybeans that provide control of, of difficult uh, Lepidoptera as well as a new mode of action that's critical to an overall resistance management plan to have any new crop approved by the regulatory bodies. We're fortunate to have really great talent within the broader plastomics community between the, the great uh, leadership with Elizabeth and Jeff, Jeff, the, co the founder of the company, Elizabeth co-founder, a board of directors that brings a depth and breadth of not only agricultural development um, expertise, but the ability to, to finance, um, to guide the companies through um, series A, B, and, and subsequent rounds, and to really craft a strategy around successful exits, a board that's highly supportive and, and collaborative. 
and a scientific advisory board that I would say is really the global standard for what you want for chloroplast transformation. Chaired by David Fishoff, a distinguished fellow from uh, recently retired from, from Monsanto, now Bayer, really one of the, the developers of one of the first traits to ever make it from R&D through to commercialization for insect control at Monsanto. Uh, Ralph Bach, who works for um, Max Planck and was a um, co-founder of the chloroplast transformation technology with Jeff at Rutgers. And we have exclusive access to any of the IP that is coming out of, of Ralph's, Ralph's lab in the field. We have Chuck Armstrong, still at Bayer, really a corn transformation expert, also a distinguished fellow. Brian Martinell, a, a Monsanto graduate, now at the University of Wisconsin, who is highly regarded as a soybean uh, transformation expert. And Ralph Quatrano, who had been an ad advisor um, to Monsanto and Monsanto's uh, R&D uh, subcommittee of their board, as well as the Dean of the Department of Biology and then Engineering at Washington University. So it's pretty unique for a startup of this size to have such a depth of experience in the development of agricultural products from discovery through commercialization and exit, both at startups and at the major corporates, an SAB of, of this kind of caliber, as well as the additional advice of, of Dr. Jim Carrington at the Danforth Plant Sciences Center and Dr. Rob Fraley, and then the benefit of all the great laboratory greenhouse resources, as well as um, other sophisticated equipment and collaboration available to us at the Donald Danforth Plant Sciences Center, where we're currently a tenant. So wh why do we think this is ultimately going to attract the interest of, of big ag? Because they're looking for new solutions and growers feel they're a little bit on a hamster wheel today without seeing where this is going to end in a way that's favorable to them. So we can deliver a, a new delivery platform for traits that don't work effectively with nuclear transformation, like RNAi that I described, or for which there's just no nuclear solution today, like the biggest uh, uh, pest in, in soybeans, stink bug. Mentioned that we'll be able to move into new markets because we won't have that outcrossing with pollen. We haven't even touched about the possibility that could exist for additional value-added traits with things like biopolymers or increasing the oil content, either in the seed or potentially in the leaves. And then there's also the benefits to the seed company themselves, reducing the time to market, reducing the cost of goods through that simplified development process and reducing overall risk without having that risk of, of outcrossing occur. So I hope I've, I've uh, given you a little insight into plastomics the potential for what it could do to grow the current biotech market and create new opportunities for growers in the industry, that it's a really unique proprietary platform that allows for new solutions with new modes of action, cheaper and, and opening up a reduced environmental footprint. New growth markets I man mentioned, the, the fact that we have really unique capabilities thanks to our location here uh, within Greater St. Louis. We've already demonstrated it can work. We, we know from, you know, legacy work at, at Bayer, at, at Monsanto, from Jeff's work at Rutgers, from uh, Max's work at Max Planck, that it's, a, that it's a proven system that just hasn't been focused on commercial crop trait delivery in the environment when we're so desperate for the need. And owing to all of this, the, the fact that we now have the system up and running in soybeans has really attracted a lot of potential partners to want to come work with us to see how their trait might advance via a chloroplast approach, via a nuclear approach. In our laboratories, we actually do both every day of the week. Our, our laboratory team works in, in doing nuclear transformation in parallel with chloroplast transformation to have that system for control. We also, in some cases, 
help out our collaborators or other startups in the industry by actually providing some nuclear services to them um, in exchange for us being able to get access to those traits to compare in a, in a chloroplast transformation system. We clearly couldn't have accomplished anything without the backing of our, of our investors, as well as um, the success that we've had in raising non-dilutive funding through a number of, of grants um, that allow us to work on some of the earlier stage higher risk technologies um, before we're, we're you know, ready to move those in, into development and investor funded projects. So David, I'll stop there and, and happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Martha. Um, and again, really appreciate you sharing and the work that Plastomics is doing is super exciting. I can, I can speak personally, it's been really exciting to watch the progress of the company and the technology over the last um, 18 months to two years. Uh, as, as Martha alluded to, um, if you do have questions, um, now is a great time uh, to chime in. Typically what we do is we ask that the audience members enter their questions into the Q&A box as opposed to the chat window. Um, it's just a little bit easier to manage if it's all in one, uh, it's all in one place. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to sort of kick things off um, just to sort of get the conversation rolling. Martha, one thing that I think is, is interesting um, is Plastomics' approach is so, is so unique and different from a lot of the other biotechnology approaches that certainly have gotten a lot more press over the last few years. You know, if we were to do a, a Google search on uh, chloroplast engineering versus CRISPR, you know, the, the results would be like totally um, skewed as you might imagine. I, I, but I am curious if you can sort of put into context sort of how emerging tools like a CRISPR and gene editing tools associated with that, uh, sort of how that ties into what Plastomics is doing, how it's similar, how it's different, how it could potentially work together and sort of what those different tools mean in the context of, of improving, improving crop traits, et cetera. Yeah, happy to David. Although I, I just had a neighbor down the street ask me if CRISPR was a new kind of French fry, so. Maybe it that's could be. Nice. <laughs> it could be the most delicious. Yeah. So, you know, CRISPR is, is clearly an exciting ad advancement, and we need all kinds of innovation and advancement in agriculture, right? It's not one or the other. They're, all of them are very complementary. Uh, the sexiness around CRISPR is the hope that it's a much um, simpler regulatory path. And that's certainly the case here in the United States where it's really going to be treated more like a breeding tool, right? Um, things are still out in terms of ultimately how Europe is gonna treat that. And so uh, until that is clear, that technology is gonna face some of the early challenges that biotech faced in having to really um, uh, limit um, and control how your product is commercialized, right? Because you aren't going to be able, you have to have a closed system to make sure that crops aren't exported to a country that wouldn't have the same regulatory framework. So I think people are hopeful that that's evolving. There's been certainly some in promising, you know, things now coming out of, of some of the European um, leader conversations that suggest it might go that way, but jury is still out. Um, I would also say that um, while, while CRISPR is great, I think of it more as our federal government regulatory agencies do as more of a breeding tool than a, um, a new, uh, and a breeding tool that can certainly provide quality traits, but much more difficult to think of that in terms of insect control, weed control, um, you know, the, the kinds of, of traits with that type of robustness versus certainly you have in traditional germplasm and breeding, the ability to impart some disease or insect resistant traits, but not with the robustness that boy, that, that biotech trait, trait can provide. So certainly with the challenges we face with a warming environment, with increased insect and disease pressure, we're gonna need all of these things coming together, all of them working in different and complementary ways. And the nice thing to me about it is none of these things force you into a decision tree where it's A or B, they're complementary, right? No, that's really helpful. Um, and so kind of like dovetailing off of that, um, when Plastomics thinks about problems that it's best fit to solve. 
versus other biotech um, solutions. Um, so how do you guys think about picking targets for both what types of problems to go after and what types of crops to go after and why chloroplast engineering would be best suited for those specific um, applications? Yeah, so we certainly need to focus on what the multinational agricultural companies, which are the seed companies, right, who are ultimately customer is most important to them and most important clearly to their customer, the grower. And so the, the first focus for plastomics clearly has to be the large acre row crops of corn and soybeans. And showing that we can do things via chloroplast transformation that can't be done or can't be done as well with nuclear transformation or, or why do you need it, right? So solving those current real problems for them like stink bug or like fall armyworm in, in corn um, where they're just, those growers are just getting hammered with, you know, um, yield reduction because of the insect damage. That has to be priority one. Um, and, and with new mode of action, of course. If all of that can be successful, then you can start lifting your eyes up a little bit and looking at future value creators, right? A soybean grower is always looking for what are new markets for my crop? What else could it be used for? So higher oil content, right? The ability to have higher protein content that might play into some of the, you know, um, alternative food markets. Uh, all of those things are, are further down the road because they're, they're value enhancing um, upside opportunities versus the bread and butter of what we have to focus on first. That makes a lot of sense. Well, I'm gonna pause here and see if there's any questions from the audience before we um, start to wrap things up here. Well, seeing that there are none, um, we do have one more question, Martha. We always want to ask our presenters um, what's something the audience can do for you um, and sort of where does plastomics need the most help going forward? Yeah, thank you, David. So um, we're always learning, right? We, we, we learn from growers, we learn from seed companies, we learn from consumers. And so knowing what you know now about um, chloroplast transformation and what we see as the benefits, what, what, would you, what, what do you see as the problems or challenges out there that it might be able to help solve? Would also say we're a small company, but we're growing. So we're always looking for talented scientists to add to our bench strength, molecular biology, right? Um, tissue culture capabilities, and uh, nothing is, is a more vibrant and rewarding environment for an individual at an early stage in their career or at a stage where they wanna give back to know that every day matters, right? You're getting out of bed to make a big difference every, every dang day. So again, would welcome suggestions, would, would welcome advice um, and, and would certainly welcome, you know, individuals interested in being a part of Plastomics day team or, or you know, helping us in any kind of other advice or consulting way. Got it. Perfect. Well, uh, Martha, if uh, anybody was looking to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to reach you? It's easy. Martha at plastomics.com. Perfect. Excellent. Well, uh, Martha, thank you so much uh, for joining today. Congrats on all the progress to date. Um, I'd like to thank the audience as well for your participation. Um, again, if you'd like to get in touch with Martha, please feel free to shoot her an email or you can ask us uh, any questions directly as well. Um, uh, for anybody who's new to these calls, we host these every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central Time. You can register for Agri-Food Conversations um, as a series by going to agrifoodconversations.com. And if you know anybody who'd like to watch this webinar, you can either share it with them via the replay link that we'll send you, or they can also go to agrifoodconversations.com to register themselves. Otherwise, thank you all for joining us. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your Thursday, and um, we'll see you next week. Thanks, David. Thanks.